China is a powerhouse in artificial intelligence. They have leading AI companies um, that are on par with leading American companies in artificial intelligence. And the Chinese military, which has been modernizing and advancing considerably over the last several decades, is going to have access to those Chinese AI companies. So the U.S. is in this very intense geopolitical competition with China over who's going to set the rules for the uh, greater Indo-Pacific region. Hi, Paul. Hi, how are you doing? Not too bad. How are you doing? Uh, good. Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. You got a new book out. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is the Non-Zero Podcast. You're Paul Shari, Vice President and Director of Studies at Center for New American Security in Washington. Uh, we're going to talk about your new book, Four Battlegrounds, Power in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. You had an earlier book called Army of None, Autonomous Weapons and the Future of War. So congratulations. You look pretty young to have uh, gotten two books out. At this rate, um, you'll surpass almost everyone in output, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Well, no promises, but I'm very excited to get the second one out the door and, and share it with yeah. folks. Yeah. Um, we should also say you've got experience in the military, right? That's right. Yeah, I was an Army Ranger. I uh, did a number of tours overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, early in the wars. OK. And, and in fact, uh, I think you say in the book that one thing that directed your attention toward the whole subject of kind of uh, the automation of war is you were in a vehicle uh, and in order to preserve its uh, to keep it intact, you wanted to disarm like a one of these uh, IEDs, these explosive devices embedded in the road and a robot uh, came out to do the job, right? And uh, what I wanted to ask was just by way of starting to get clear on terminology, because you know, in AI, uh, there's this old joke, like the definition of artificial intelligence is whatever computers can't do yet. In other words, yeah, exactly. in, other words in other words, every time they make an advance, yep. people start taking it <laughs> for granted and say, well, when are you gonna do something really impressive? Uh, you know, there was a time when they couldn't figure out how to uh, get it to do this most simple kind of object recognition. That was actually a huge challenge. So so my question is, if you've got a robot that is just a remote control puppet, right? It's just like somebody somewhere is looking through its eyes and controlling its arms uh, and that's it. Is that is that artificial intelligence in your sense of the word or is that just like a remote control? robot. Yeah. Well, that's a good one because you jumped right into a really thorny area in terms of the terminology. Um, and there isn't widespread agreement on this. So even among AI researchers, there's not agreement on what to call artificial intelligence. And there is this phenomenon, as you talked about, where AI is the things that haven't been invented yet. Mm -hmm. So when we don't have the ability, for example, um, to build a computer that could beat humans at chess before uh, IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, then, you know, a chess playing program was AI. Mm -hmm. And then once we did it, people are like, oh, that's just that's just a computer program. Um, and we see that continue to evolve today. So I think, you know, the, the term robot gets thrown around pretty loosely um, in the military. They certainly uh, have used the term robot to refer to small ground robots. I, I use the term right there myself. Um, that are used for things like bomb disposal. And uh, you mentioned this story at the opening of uh, my most recent book, Four Battlegrounds, where I talk about an incident where I saw one of these small ground robots being used in Iraq to defuse a bomb. But those are really remotely controlled. And so uh, they're certainly not autonomous robots in the sense of a, a robotic system that can sense the environment, and then make some kind of decision and then act in response. Mm -hmm. um, but these things are, the terminology is really slippery. I mean, I've been in debates with people in the military where they'll be looking at some system and saying, well, is this autonomous or is it just automated? Right. And like, well, what's the difference between those? Or people will debate, well, is this a, a true swarm or is it just a team of robots working together? And what's the difference between those things? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then, you know, understanding those concepts matter, but the labels are not necessarily applied consistently among different people who work in this space. Okay. Well, let me ask you, uh, you know, right now, as you may have heard, there's war going on in Ukraine. Um, a lot of drones. In fact, one, you know, this, this, I guess, may be the war that in retrospect is becomes known as the war where where drones really became kind of front and center on both sides. Um, the uh, and they're and they're used in various ways. They're used sheerly for surveillance and location of targets. They're they're used uh, to fire missiles. They're also they're also kamikaze drones. Um, but uh, what is my sense is that for the most part, uh, it's it's remote control. It's there's not a lot of autonomous. Uh, well, certainly, uh, I, I'm not. A, I haven't heard of any autonomous decision making yet. In other words, right. it decides yeah. whether to fire. Is there much in the way of uh, target recognition that is that is saving you know people the trouble of having to say that's a tank, that's a tank? Is there so far as you're aware? Is there any of that going on? Well, we're starting to get there. It's a great question because, as you said, most of the drones being used in Ukraine are remotely operated. They're being flown by people who then identify the targets on the ground. Um, in fact, in some ways, some of the more sophisticated anti-tank missiles, like a Javelin, for example, have more autonomy hmm. than some of the drones mm -hmm. because uh, a Javelin is, um, is you know, the human chooses the target and locks onto the target. But then once the missile's been launched, it actually maneuvers in flight to uh, attack the tank or armored vehicle on its own. And Will it, will it go is, around uh, obstacles to do that? Uh, no, but it'll come. Um, the Javelin has the ability to do a top attack, so it'll come up on top of the tank where the armor mm -hmm. is the lightest. Um, and so it'll... You know, it'll lock onto the tank and then autonomously fly that path to then come in on top uh -huh. of it. That's not manually controlled, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we are starting to see some use of machine learning image classifiers in Ukraine. There have been um, just a couple incidents that came out uh, last year where some of the drone operators in Ukraine, many of which are just civilian hobbyists that are you know, using drones that they have, they're partnering with the Ukrainian military, and they're taking this commercial technology and they're using it very rapidly, whether it's the drones themselves, the commercial satellite technology like the Starlink, or in this case, machine learning and embedding it into drones. And so there were some videos that have come out that have shown drone footage in Ukraine and that appear to have AI-based image classifiers that are doing what you're describing, they're identifying objects which is very doable using uh -huh. artificial intelligence today. Uh, it's very good at image classification if you have a good database of labeled images and they're identifying trucks or tanks or, or other vehicles. And um, in at least one instance, that drone equipped with that AI image classification was used in a lethal attack against a Russian tank. Now, it appears as though people are still in the loop, uh, if you will, making those decisions for now. So it's not fully automated. Making the firing decision, but it knew to right. lock onto a tank and kind of said, look, here's a tank. I found a tank. That's right, because the the um, AI system itself can identify the object. And so it, it'll put a little, you know, people may have, listeners or viewers may have seen some of these online, where it'll, the AI will draw a box around an object and then identify what it is, right? So if it was looking at, say, our video, it might a box around our faces and identify that's right. a person. Right. Um, and it can do that with vehicles like tanks and even give a probability that, you know, it's 90% certain that this is a tank. Um, now, again, right now, people are making that decision to then carry out an attack. But you can see that all of the technologies in place to take people out of that if someone wanted to. And there must be prototypes floating around DARPA or somewhere, right, of, of things that can actually do that, of drones that actually do that. Well, you know, what's amazing is the uh, underlying technology to do that, at least in a simple fashion, has been around actually for decades. Yeah. And so there have been examples of loitering munitions that militaries have fielded that would go out over a wide area, search for targets, find them, attack them all on their own. Uh, the U.S. Navy actually fielded and had its inventory 
a missile like this, the Tomahawk anti-ship missile, not the same as the Tomahawk cruise missile that, that folks have probably heard of and that's used very regularly. This mm-hmm. was a different one that's designed to target ships based on their radars. And it was an autonomous weapon. Um, was never fired, as far as I know, in uh, a combat situation, and it's been phased out of the U.S. inventory. But the Israeli Harpy drone is an example of this that is still in operation. Uh, it's an anti-radar weapon. So it flies over an area and looks for enemy radars. And then when it finds one, it can attack it all on its own. Uh, the drone basically kamikazes into the radar mm-hmm. and doesn't need any further human permission. And, and that's it, it, it's to- not identifying it just visually, right? It's sensing the radiation coming from it. That's right. So it's sensing the radiation. So that's much easier if you have, as you can imagine, a target that's emitting in the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's not using machine learning and art- what we would call artificial intelligence. Maybe 40 years ago, it would have been called AI, but not today. Mm-hmm. Um, identifying the emissions from a radar and then targeting based on that. But that basic concept of an autonomous weapon has been around. It's not really in widespread use, but it has been deployed before uh, several decades old. Mm -hmm. What's new now is the AI-based image classifiers that that really expand the intelligence, if you will, Mm -hmm. of what you could do with weapon systems going forward. Right. And uh, as you suggested, it's kind of doable now. I mean, uh, but they're not, apparently they're not, doing it in in Ukraine. Um, you know, if you take this basic idea and and project into the future, I mean, as you as you do in the book, uh, you can imagine war without humans because I mean, this can be done in ground systems. You could have autonomous tanks uh, and so on. And uh, you could have two, uh, you know, systems that don't don't have any humans actually, present fighting it out i mean in principle you can do that with with remote control for that matter right uh but but um but certainly you probably the the winning team would be the one that's making some use of autonomous decision making i would guess if they're doing it well uh but you can't imagine such a thing right and and i mean a question that occurred to me is well okay so i guess you gain you, you know you you gain ground can you hold ground without people i mean uh, and in principle, you can, because if you if you're hold, you know, if you've got if the front line is going to kill anything that approaches, well, that's what people do when they're holding ground. Right. I mean, uh, I don't know. what do you, do you see that actually happening? Yeah, well, I think you can think about artificial intelligence uh, coming into militaries in phases over time. So we're already in the sort of initial phase where we have these relatively discrete one-off applications of AI. Uh, The U.S. Defense Department's first AI application using deep learning, for example, coming out of the Deep Learning Revolution Project Maven, is now over five years old. Mm -hmm. And that was using AI-based image classifiers, like we've been talking about, to analyze drone footage. Now, that wasn't linked then to the drones attacking autonomously. This was just helping people sift through drone images. But that's over five years old. And I think we're likely to see over the next 10 to 15 years, militaries incorporating more AI applications in different aspects of military operations. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is kind of, well, what does that look like over time when we begin to see militaries have AI deployed in a widespread manner across warfare? And uh, people have compared what we're seeing with artificial intelligence to something like another industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. If you look at the industrial revolution, it transformed warfare in these huge ways. And in particular, the industrial revolution transformed the physical scale of warfare. So it expanded the destructive power that militaries could bring to the battlefield and um, built a scale of destruction and its intensity. And we saw in World War II, whole cities destroyed in Europe and Asia as a consequence of this new industrial age technology turned towards warfare. So what does that look like in an age of artificial intelligence? And, um, you know, that's a difficult question. I think the, you know, it's, it's hard to foresee the future, but one way to think about this is that just like the industrial revolution transformed the physical aspects of warfare, AI is likely to transform the cognitive aspects or the intelligent aspects of warfare. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Now, Chinese military scholars refer to this process as the intelligentization of their armed forces, or you might think of it as the cognitization of armed forces. Um, just like we saw the industrial revolution, you know, have sort of the industrialization of society uh, and of warfare. AI is going to do this from an intelligence or cognitive standpoint. And so some of the effects could be things like helping militaries process more amounts of information faster, mm -hmm. get a more cohesive view of the battlefield, um, accelerate decision timelines, uh, find the ability to have military forces operate in a more cohesive manner over time, but then faster in terms of understanding the battlefield, making decisions, and then reacting. Mm -hmm. And we actually see in gaming environments these like really intriguing ways that AI agents are better than humans. So when we look at games like chess, Go, Dota 2, StarCraft, where poker, for example, where AI systems have achieved superhuman performance. Uh, and what's kind of amazing is they're not just better than people, but they actually play differently than people. And that's sort of intriguing to me because it suggests that in other domains, including in warfare, mm -hmm. we may be able over time to see AI agents, they're not just better than people, but also that operate in different ways and that might cause warfare to... Um, we see militaries fighting differently than they would with humans. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I mean, human decision making in war goes all the way up from the completely local, where it's like, that seems to be a guy in an enemy uniform. I guess I should shoot him to, uh, you know, uh, really kind of micro tactics, you might say, a few guys coordinating to, uh, you know, broader tactical level to strategy. And you kind of you you talk about these various things. I mean, can you imagine that you know there's a famous uh, well uh, example in the in the Ukraine war where uh, you know in paving the way for this uh, this this thing I guess in September when Ukraine took a lot of ground in uh, Kharkiv province. I guess that started out with Ukraine planning to focus on a southern offensive. They were talking to the Americans and the American account is that Americans suggested, well, actually, there's I think there's a weak point up here we, around Kharkiv we, you might be able to take advantage of. And that's the way this played out. My question is, can you imagine a day when uh, instead of, of going to the Americans and saying, well, here's what we're planning, you, you go to something that with an interface like chat G, GPT and say, well, here's what we're planning. And it actually gives you productive feedback, like uh, possibly a better idea? I mean, I think it's it's certainly, particularly for those who interact with something like ChatGPT, it's conceivable to imagine tools that might provide some useful input mm -hmm. um, where you might say, okay, well, that, that gives me some ideas as a starting point to think about what to do. Um, it's very hard for me to imagine in any reasonable time frame, a situation where we would entirely turn over that kind of decision making and warfare to machines. Sure, and but I mean, really the, the, the consultation could the consultation be of the quality that the Americans apparently provided to the Ukrainians? Is is kind of what the the counsel, the guidance? I mean, like here's a totally new yeah. idea you haven't thought of, and it's like, well, thank you, ChatGPT. We'll we'll do that. I mean, I don't not the not to the point where you'd want to trust it without having human input and thinking. Because one of the things that machines, so machines are great at some things, but they're not better than humans overall. Mm -hmm. And the human brain remains the most advanced cognitive processing system on the planet, at least at least for now. <laughs> and uh, um, we, we may be flattering ourselves already, who knows, but go yeah. ahead. Well, the pace of advances is pretty, is pretty impressive in AI, yeah. but at least for now, one of the things that machines really struggle with is flexibly responding to novel situations. And so a lot of these AI systems, they're very brittle. They're good. Their intelligence is, um, is often very capable, but in these very narrow domains. Mm -hmm. So as one example of this, uh, one of the early versions of AlphaGo, the AI system that achieved superhuman performance at the game of Go, that was better than the best Go players in the world. But reportedly, if you change the size of the board just slightly, its performance would drop off dramatically. Hmm. Why? Because it wasn't trained on that size board. 
Right. And it didn't have the ability to generalize what it had learned to an even ever so slightly different environment, much mm-hmm. less take some of the broader strategic concepts of Go and apply them to some other game like chess, for example. Um, couldn't do that at all. And mm-hmm. so that kind of flexibility and adaptability is something we don't yet see in machines. It's always something that people are working on. Um, but in warfare, that's an area where that's really important. Because war is a lot more complex than Go, for example. Uh, Your enemy is not constrained in what they can do. The enemy is adaptive and creative. And so I think that's a a space where at the uh, strategic level, we're really going to need humans involved for some time. Yeah, I would also suspect that at least if there is going to be an AI that can really think outside the box, it would have to be different from ChatGPT because ChatGPT basically does a good job of telling you what a number of people could tell you. It, it, it's kind of a conventional wisdom summarizer to some extent. Um, but uh, then in between you know, strategy and kind of uh, target ID, there's a whole range of tactical decisions and kind of battlefield coordination issues. One thing you talk about is the possibility of swarms of drones. Um, now I gather in, the, in that case, uh, the drones, because you know you could do swarms of remote control drones. If right. the only if the only point of the exercise is to have the drones like attack from a bunch of different angles, that's not that complicated. But with swarms, you're imagining the drones uh, responding to things other drones are doing. Is that is that right? The way the way birds do. I mean, birds, you know, process information kind of locally. They look at what their neighbors are doing. And uh, and and then it turns. It looks like it's being guided by a larger intelligence, a bird swarm, uh, but they're just responding to one another. Um, is is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, that's exactly right. Because that is the the essence of a swarm is that coordinated autonomous behavior. So a great example of this, you know, certainly a flock of birds or a school of fish, or think of like a wolf pack. A wolf pack hunts as a unit, as a pack. And that's how the wolf pack is so lethal. It's much more effective than if you just had a whole bunch of lone wolves operating together. Um, we see this in sports all the time, right? There's a big difference between, you know, a basketball team and five ball hogs on a court. Um, and so that that coordinated behavior is what really starts to unlock some really powerful capabilities, whether it's in um, you know, the natural world or sporting mm-hmm. or in warfare. Now, humans do this. So an infantry squad doesn't fight as individual people. They fight as a unit and they're responding to each other. But that's where we need to get to um, from a military standpoint with robotic systems. Well, right now, the systems that militaries are using, the drones or ground robots, they are remote controlled. And so there's a person on the other end directing the drone where to go. And that's really limited in terms of applications. The next evolution is to have one person controlling many drones. But again, if the person is directing each one what to do, there's only so many you could handle at one time, maybe two or three or four, but not 50. Mm -hmm. That's not realistic. And so to get to these very large numbers, you have to get to this swarming uh, concept or what militaries call command and control, this swarming command and control concept where the human is not actually tasking the individual drones. It's telling the swarm to go conduct a mission, right. to go perform reconnaissance of an area or defend an asset or attack something. And then the agents within the swarm coordinate amongst themselves. And there's a variety of different ways to do this to then carry out that task totally autonomously. And I guess if you ask, uh, well, why can't you just pre-program the whole thing so it's like a ballet and you know what everything's going to do at every moment? The the answer is at some point, one of the drones is going to respond to new information about the local environment. Like first drone that spots some tank goes down and does something. And then you don't want all the other drones spending their time killing the same tank so that they start responding to what what to each other. and, And that's the way that unfolds, I guess. Well, the, the ballet is a good example. You could pre-program a ballet because it has a script, but that doesn't work in a competitive environment. Right. So if you try to do that with a sports team for like a basketball team, they're going to be defeated pretty quickly. Because there's new information coming in about what the opponent's doing and where they are. 
That's right. You need to be adaptive to what's happening out in the environment. Yeah. So um, the uh, I don't know. There's a lot going on. I mean, in the in the extreme sci-fi case, uh, you 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 kind of flirt uh, near the end with a scenario where uh, you you even have the AI kind of simulating what's going to happen so confidently maybe on both sides that they just the machines just say well we can predict what's going to happen in this war so you don't really have to bother fighting it you just have to cede this territory because you would have done I mean, right i mean now, now do, i kind of yeah, there, there's a related star trek episode uh that's right <laughs> that yeah. i won't get into but 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 um uh I kind of have trouble imagining that happening in, in part because of what we just said. It's like a response to local knowledge can ripple through the system. And the question arises like it's almost philosophical, but could you could you ever have a computer who's simulating power is is up to the challenge? It seems almost by definition you couldn't. If you've got your most powerful computers out there doing the responding. Then you haven't yet built a computer so powerful that it could accommodate all that. Take it all in as input and tell you, give you the output. I don't know. Maybe I'm. Uh, maybe we should get back to more concrete things. But <laughs> but I assume you're just kind of fooling around when you throw that possibility out there, right? Like, yeah, like so I think you know, kind of come and say, okay, we don't need to fight thinking about how might AI change warfare. Um, things get increasingly speculative. So one of the more intriguing ideas that, that I've heard is some Chinese scholars have hypothesized about this idea of a battlefield singularity, a point in time where the pace of action on the battlefield eclipses human comprehension and the ability for humans to respond. And militaries basically have to turn over the keys to AI systems. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this in other areas, like in stock trading. That's certainly the case for some gaming environments like StarCraft or Dota 2, where uh, the AI systems are just better than humans. Uh, it's even the case really now for chess, where there isn't the time pressure. Um, so that's taken out of the equation. But the AI systems just make better decisions. And so the whole world of 10 years ago, we might have talked about centaur chess, where humans and machines are working together. Like that's pretty much over. And as uh, human just gets in the way and you should just trust the AI system. Mm -hmm. So that's like one future that you could imagine happening as AI systems become increasingly incorporated into militaries over time, over several decades. That's not like a near term thing at all. But mm -hmm. one of the things I do talk about in the book is some uh, even more speculative, longer term things about how AI could potentially change even the nature of war itself. And that's in, in defense circles, that's a really contentious proposition because there's this idea, and it's a little bit kind of wonky here, um, that in defense circles, people who study warfare, they talk about the character of warfare, the way that militaries fight is constantly changing. We mm -hmm. see this in Ukraine, um, the, the way that the, the tactics are being used, constantly evolving, new technologies are being incorporated, um, so the way that militaries are fighting are changing, but the nature of war itself is unchanging. And so there are some essential elements of what war is as a violent clash of wills, a political struggle between groups um, that that is true today and has been true, you know, a thousand years ago. And one intriguing question is, well, could AI change that? Because now we're actually introducing a non-human element to warfare. So I don't think that's a near-term thing, but um, it does raise interesting questions about ways that over time, AI could even change the nature of war itself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as we suggested, it, it, I guess it's not crazy to think you, that you get to a point where on the battlefield itself, no death is happening. I mean, I mean, I mean because they're all, it's all machines. Now, that might uh, increase the incentive to, to, to go reach behind the battle lines and... Uh, kill the people ultimately in charge. I don't know, but uh, it's, um, I guess it's kind of hard to figure. Now, a, a big theme in the book um, is China, uh, right. because, you know, China seems to be the great uh, emerging rival by conventional reckoning. Um, and they're, they've been doing a lot in um, AI. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, we seem to be, 
approaching a kind of a, moving toward at least a kind of a decoupling with China um, to some extent at the economic level. I mean, it, you know, it, it, you shouldn't overstate it. There's pretty deep engagement economically. Yeah. It, it would yeah. be hard to unwind the whole thing. Um, but there's also been collaboration on AI, on, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the technology making systems had been very uh, closely intertwined. Um, you're kind of anticipating that we are going to have to selectively disengage. I mean, you're not, uh, well, let's take a concrete example that, that isn't AI per se, but, but you talk about a little, um, the Biden administration has, uh, is, is making a lot, it a lot harder for China to get its hands on, uh, chip, well, chips and chip making mm -hmm. technology. Yep. And you, you make a big distinction between those. Uh, the, uh, the, the right, right now, the deal is that the administration, um, and this has only come out over the last year, I guess, but, um, that it isn't just that there are now pretty severe restrictions on American chip exports to China, but if some European company uses American technology in something it exports to China, we apparently have the power to veto that, and we're doing it. Oh, so, yeah. so, and, and and I gather your idea is that it does make sense to um, exclude chip making technology from export to china that's like this very rarefied thing where like there's this one dutch company that has yeah. the best stuff and if you can't get your hands on that you can't be at the frontier of chip making which china isn't now anyway which which taiwan alone really is but um the uh but you're you're saying that makes sense but it makes as i understand it makes less sense to uh to do the thing with chips because uh for one thing it's going to incentivize european companies to start making products without american technology i guess since they won't mm -hmm. be under this restriction and secondly it's going to uh of course encourage china uh to create its own native chip making ability i guess one question is why doesn't that last piece of uh logic also apply to the chip making technology i mean it seems to me as soon as you start saying you can't have the chip making machines they get the picture, right? They're gonna, they're just gonna have to yeah, go native right. and, and create an entirely indigenous uh system. But but still, you're saying that uh you that that, that part is okay, that part makes sense, but we shouldn't be doing as much as we're doing in restricting uh chip imports by by China and chip related imports. That's right. And I realize it is it is a somewhat uh Subtle and kind of nuanced argument, but um, maybe like the the why this matters is I think really important to start with, which is that China is a powerhouse in artificial intelligence. They have leading AI companies um, that are on par with leading American companies in artificial intelligence, and the Chinese military, which has been modernizing and advancing considerably over the last several decades, is going to have access to those Chinese AI companies. So the U.S. is in this very intense geopolitical competition with China over who's going to set the rules for the uh, greater Indo-Pacific region. China is getting stronger. It's muscling its way around other smaller countries in the region. And the U.S. has uh, commitments to other allies in the Pacific region. And we really don't want to live in a, a China-dominated uh, world or a world where China is setting the rules of the global order or dominating the fastest growing region economically in the world. And technology is an important enabler of military and economic and political power. And AI is absolutely critical and will shape um, all of these facets of national power going forward, uh, economic development, uh, political power, military power. And so how do you lead in AI, particularly how do you control the spread of AI? Because it is so widely available. Because mm -hmm. you can go online uh, to places like GitHub, where there are trained neural networks that someone can download for free. And so the AI community is very open. There's a lot of collaboration between American and Chinese scientists, some of which does filter back to 
um, the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army. Now, U.S. policymakers have been trying to pull some of these apart, some of this selective decoupling that you're talking about. But one of the things that is the most controllable for AI is the chips, because you need to run uh, these AI models on chips in order to train them. So you know, when we talk about things like cloud computing, it doesn't happen just in the ether. The cloud is a giant uh, warehouse full of, of you know servers of racks of computer processors and chips running uh, for some of these big AI models like ChatGPT, they're trained on thousands of specialized chips, uh, graphics processing units or GPUs <laughs> running for weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. So if you can control access to the chips, you can control access to AI. And that's mm-hmm. what the US uh, is doing with the Biden administration's new controls on chip exports to China. And what the administration is doing is the, right now, US companies are in a dominant position in a few key nodes in the chip supply chain. So the chip supply chain is very globalized. Um, Chips are made all throughout the world, but for the really high-end chips, it's very concentrated. So to make some of the most advanced chips, there is one company in the world, ASML in the Netherlands, uh, which you mentioned, that makes the lithography equipment that's used um, to make these chips. And then there are other areas like the chemicals, like photoresist, uh, where Japan is leading. There are areas like the software used to build these chips where uh, U.S. companies are in the lead. And mm-hmm. in fact, between the Netherlands and the U.S. and Japan, they control 90% of the global market for this equipment that you need to manufacture the most high-end chips. And so that's a place where the U.S. has uh, put these export controls in place to limit the spread of this technology to China. We've seen uh, relatively recently, Japan and the Netherlands actually joined the U.S. to control this technology going to China. And that'll keep China from having their own ability to produce chips. Mm -hmm. And so that'll keep China dependent on foreign supplies. Now, what the administration has also done is cut off the supplies of the chips themselves to China. And so they're actually denying China the ability to um, get these chips, which are manufactured uh, predominantly in Taiwan and South Korea. Again, these, using these the are relatively of, advanced chips. There's some chips you can still export to China, I guess. That's right. But, it's only the most advanced ones. So it's yeah. about um, 1% of the chips that China is importing are controlled. So it's actually and, really only a small and, sliver. And can I interrupt you? So yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it your belief that the, the motivation behind this thing really is fundamentally about AI? Because when I first heard about it, it seemed like, is this just economic warfare? Are we just trying to cripple their industry? You think no. this really AI is the motivating uh, concern here and not necessarily just battlefield AI per se. There are other ways that AI could make uh, China a form- more formidable, but but it is about AI in your view. Yeah, absolutely. It's about AI um, or supercomputers are also um, controlled and supercomputers can be used for modeling and simulations for things like nuclear explosions. And so that's another concern. But it's really about AI and it's about military applications of AI. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you can't cleanly separate the AI technology that's being used in the civilian sector versus military applications because the technology is so multi-purpose. So if you sell a chip, it's not like the chips that the military uses to train AI models are different than the ones that are used by civilian companies. It's the same chip. So by by targeting those chips, you're basically right now, the administration is going across the board um, and targeting everyone. Now, there are other approaches. They could try to say, well, we're just going to not allow sales to certain companies that we know are working with the military. I actually think that would be a better approach. Um, and sell them to commercial entities. But there's a risk, uh, and mm-hmm. it's a very real one, that then the chips are diverted and some of them go to military use because it is, it's exactly the same technology. But the idea that this is somehow trying to like cripple China's economy is is completely mm-hmm. ridiculous because the, the number of chips that's controlled is, again, it's very, very small. It's like 1% of the total amount of chips that China's importing. So it's not, this is not the same kind of thing that's going to have some mm-hmm. massive countrywide effect. Okay. Now, among the concerns commonly raised in the context of China is uh, this idea that they will use technology to spread 
uh, or their technology will help spread the an authoritarian or autocratic model. I personally think that's kind of overblown and and really shouldn't uh, the whole the whole idea of of democracy versus autocracy shouldn't be at the center piece of our foreign policy because it can become a self fulfilling prophecy. But that aside, that is the concern. Um, and I wanted to ask you a couple of things. First of all, there, there's a, a, a point in the book where you uh, talk about how the global standards uh, that are agreed upon can actually kind of influence mm-hmm. uh, things in ways you might not expect. And this is an idea that goes back to, I don't know, Lawrence Lessig used to talk about this in other contexts, about how the code can be kind of determinative in some sense. You say that, uh, you know, China has been uh, active in setting international tech standards. And you you talk about how um, its role in setting facial recognition standards could actually facilitate uh, the, the kind of uh, unfortunate use of this kind of technology. It's used for authoritarian purposes or something. I didn't re- I didn't totally get that. Can you sketch? uh that out the way i mean i would have thought i guess naively and it's the way i reacted less argument is i don't get how the setting of the standards uh it, it has this pervasive and subtle influence on on uh on more substantive things but how does that how would that work out yeah so i think i guess the fundamental foundational idea that's that's important for us is that artifacts are not um sort of values neutral so one can argue that science is value neutral, it's just knowledge. But once we start taking that knowledge and then building some object for some purpose, there's an implication about what we value, but what we make it easy to do or difficult to do with that object. Mm-hmm. Um, modern information technology is a good example of this. And that the current information technology ecosystem, computer networks and computers and, and social media make the flow of information relatively easy. And that is in part because of the values of some of the Silicon Valley engineers that kicked off uh, the information revolution and who wanted to enable the free flow of information. And you could design computers and computer networks where information is naturally much more tightly controlled, um, where chips make it harder um, for you know to process information and you need more permissions to do so. Uh, you could imagine computer architectures that place security first and put a lot of barriers in operation. And they'd probably be more secure, um, but then you know be less usable in other ways. Right. So that's, I think, an important kind of context. Now, what we see... So does that kind of stuff flow from international standard setting, or is that just more inherently national policy making? Well, it's both, right? Because then what happens is so so com- um, companies get together internationally through forums like the ITU and others, and they set technical standards for various types of devices and how they're going to communicate to one another um, and how they're going to pass data or how they're going to interface. Mm-hmm. And you want ideally those things to be technocratic discussions about what's the most capable technology. Now, what we've seen China doing in areas like 5G wireless networks is putting their thumb on the scale and bringing in a very politicized process and one that is going to tilt the playing field in favor of Chinese companies. And one of the concerns with things like facial recognition is that we've seen China be very active and be pushing forward technical standards that then might make it easier to um, adopt some of China's model of surveillance technology, where we've seen that they are going to have uh, already massive numbers of cameras, about 500 million cameras estimated deployed inside China, um, and increasingly using facial recognition technology and um, sharing that data. And so enabling that technology, making it easier to use, and then exporting its sort of techno authoritarian model of surveillance to other countries. So those the standards it wants would give its companies a competitive edge. Yeah, right, right. So there's two concerns. One is that um, China is politicizing standards and giving Chinese companies mm. a competitive advantage. And we want to level playing field among companies, but also that some standards um, may have important implications from a value standpoint, um, things like facial recognition. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of how easy it is to use the technology or how difficult it might be to uh, protect data versus share data. Yeah. And 
we want to be engaged in those to make sure that they're the technical standards are facilitating uses that maybe are not consistent with democratic values. I guess another way to put the question is right now, I don't know if you've heard about this, Madison Square Garden. Have you heard about this case? Uh, they, uh, you know, Madison Square Garden, the company that runs, they get sued a lot. So there's a number of law firms that represent people who are in litigation yeah. with them. Yeah. They have facial recognition technology. If you're coming into Madison Square Garden and they see via their facial recognition technology that you are a lawyer at a firm that is in litigation with them, they will deny you entrance to Madison Square Garden, even wow. if you're not even if you're not a lawyer directly involved in the case. Now, it just seems to me that this kind of use, the potential for this is just inherent in facial recognition technology, whatever standard, whatever technical standards are governing it. And if it's not going to happen, that's going to have to be a matter of national policy making, right? We, we, uh, uh, another way to put it is there's clearly a, uh, plenty of people in America who want facial recognition tech. We want it. Our police, you know, our police are going to be using it. Let's face it. Madison Square Garden is using it. And also for more legitimate ways, like to screen out uh, Taylor Swift stalkers, which they also do. Now, uh, it, it's going to happen. It, it, the technology is going to be here. Uh, I guess I don't understand how the finer points of the technical standards are going to be determinative. It seems to me it's going to be much. It's just going to be about about policymaking, national, could be international policymaking. I mean, you could agree that certain uses are illegitimate, but that's a different kind of policy from technical standards, right? Well, it is, it is a different thing. And certainly the legal frameworks matter enormously here, right? So in that case, I mean, the really valuable tool for addressing that, if you think that's wrong, would be uh, legal ones and regulating what companies can and cannot do. And even that's probably arguably not a facial recognition thing, as it is just, can a company lawfully deny entry to someone for these purposes? You know, is mm -hmm. that a sort of permitted thing for a company to do? Um, and then there's a, also a question about using facial recognition. I think those are difficult things we're going to have to work through as a society in terms of things like, if I'm walking down the street, is there a camera that's allowed to capture my face and store sure. that data? And what's going to be done with that data? I'm in a public space. Is that permitted? Like, those are difficult questions to work mm. with. But the, where the technical standards come into play is, I'll give an example about data. So right now, some of these generative AI models like stable diffusion uh, generate these images and create AI-generated art. It's really pretty good. And a lot of artists are concerned because they're, they're trained, these models are trained on their artwork. So there's a legal question about whether or not training an AI model on other images is fair use from a copyright standpoint. Um, and that's a legal question that needs to be addressed. The companies say it is, others say it's not. There's lawsuits that are underway. Um, but that's possible. So taking these other images and training an AI model is possible though, in part because the images themselves are so easy to share. These digital files mm -hmm. exist online. And other people can take them and do something with them. So, you know, this video uh, gets posted online and someone else can take a screenshot of our faces. And then an image file gets created on their computer that they can do whatever they want with. And so those technical choices about what the technology allows you to do then enable these other uses that raise legal questions. And so that's a place where the technical standards do matter um, because they are going to enable or make easier some kinds of uses or others. Okay. Uh, a kind of related thing is, um, you know, there's a lot of concern about China uh, exporting software that can be put to authoritarian use more broadly, not just facial recognition technology, but, you know, probably the leader exporter of such software is Israel, right? A democracy. And uh, again, you know, this is, I'm talking about spyware, that can, you know, there are these famous cases you're aware of that where, uh, and, um, and, you know, I don't know what Palantir is doing, Peter Thiel's company. I, I've got, I've got questions about how that stuff's getting used. Uh, but, but, um, uh, you know, the point is the, the free market system is, is very good at meeting demand. And right. the question is going to be, do countries want to buy this kind of stuff and put it to nefarious use? If they do, 
Uh, I don't think China is going to be the only source uh, unless, again, we, we come up with international agreements among uh, free market economies broadly that they just won't make this stuff or won't export it or something. So I, I don't know. I, I guess part of my concern is like uh, th there's plenty of tension between the U.S. and China right now without exaggerating the extent of the threat they pose. Um, and I'm I'm just not. I'm not, I'm not uh, yet convinced that there being a, a source point for authoritarian software distinguishes them from any any number of countries that we consider to be on on our side in the emerging Cold War. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I do think that there is a broader global struggle underway between um, democracy as a system of governance and authoritarianism. We've seen rising authoritarianism in a range of states. Certainly uh, China is one, but but others, Russia, um, Iran, but also democratic backsliding within democracies, um, where we've seen an erosion of democratic values and institutions. And I think that's a that's a very concerning trend. It's not an easy one. It's not one that's boiled down to simply US versus China. Um, but I do think on the, the technology side, one of the concerning things is that technology can be an enabler of better democratic institutions or can undermine them. Social media is a great example where it can enable polarization and the spread of disinformation. So there are things internally in America that we're wrestling with and, and struggling with. I think what's troubling about China is China has built this very sophisticated uh, surveillance system at home where they have increasing network of surveillance, not just cameras, but also things that are monitoring people's movements, their credit card transactions, to track where people are going, what they're doing, to put in place uh, procedures, to steer human behavior, things like their social credit system and various blacklists for certain kinds of behavior. And then China is exporting globally their technology and some of their norms and values. And so China has done things like um, training for other countries on China's model of media, for example. Well, China has a censored media ecosystem. So mm -hmm. do we want other countries replicating that? And, um, you know, today, China's surveillance network is, is patchy. It's not perfect. It's not at the level that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to achieve where they have complete control over where people go and what they do. But they're working on it. And if we look at what China's done over the last 20 years in terms of internet censorship and propaganda, you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't that great. China started to put up their great firewall mm -hmm. and it was it had holes in it and people could get around it. And a lot of folks, including a lot of U.S. leaders, said that China wouldn't be successful at this. Uh, Bill Clinton had famously compared this to trying to nail jello to the wall, trying to control the internet. China did it. And mm -hmm. right now, they have incredible control over the information environment inside China. And, um, you know, they have intense censorship. They uh, have intense propaganda. And they're able to shape this information space. And they're working to do the same now for physical control. So I think it's deeply troubling, not just for the human rights of Chinese citizens, but also for the concern that that model becomes replicated globally. And we're already seeing countries in Southeast Asia, South America, and Africa, and even in Europe, taking Chinese surveillance technology and employing it domestically for surveillance. And that's, I think, a, a very worrying trend. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering actually how actually distinctively Chinese a lot of that technology is and, and whether, uh, and what, what forces really are ultimately going to shape the decisions that nations make about whether to adopt such technology and which of our policy levers can influence that and so on. But that anyway, that's not mainly what your book is about. Um, the I wanted to ask you a question about uh, uh, kind of um, arms races. Th there are, uh, you know, there are some arms race dynamics that are obviously concerning, mm -hmm. like Nuclear weapons, you know, when you get to the point where a nuclear war would destroy every human being, you kind of rather, in a way, not to have gotten to that point, right. although a certain a, a certain level of armament can serve a deterrent purpose, but you really don't need to be able to wipe out the whole planet. Um, the uh, 
and um, you know, in in uh, other areas as well. And also, there are areas where it's clear to me that it would be concerning for us and China to be developing the technology in an atmosphere of kind of uh, mutual isolation and suspicion, like human genetic engineering. It's like, if we're thinking of that as an arms race and like wondering what are the Chinese going to be up to, yeah. we're just not going to regulate it the way we might if if we weren't concerned about that. We will be less cautious. Now, there's a kind of analogy to that maybe in AI that you talk about uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't yet, yet see it as a, comp as compelling concern as I see genetic engineering, mm -hmm. but, but anyway, there are concerns, right? I, I mean, about what the arms race dynamic could do in the realm of AI, in your view, right? That's right. I, I am concerned about, um, the risk that these competitive dynamics between the U.S. and China lead to these race dynamics where countries are racing forward and doing things that maybe you would otherwise not want them to be doing and has a net negative effect. Now, in the nuclear weapons space, it's a good example of an arms race. And in that case, the arms race was building up the quantity of nuclear weapons to these you know, completely sort of ludicrous levels where you could wipe out everyone on earth, you know, multiple times over. Um, the concern in AI is not that, it's not sort of the quantity of AI. My concern is about a race to the bottom on AI safety. That is a race to fielding AI systems before they're adequately tested and they're safe. Now, the troubling thing is we are actually seeing this happen right now in the commercial sector. And ChatGPT kicked this off where OpenAI's release of ChatGPT has completely shifted the dynamic among major tech companies towards large language models like ChatGPT. So prior to that, all of the major tech companies had their own internal models, but they'd been not, they'd been really restrictive in terms of releasing them. And they'd not been showing a lot of times what they could do, in part because of work that OpenAI itself had done a few years ago with a predecessor called GPT-2, where OpenAI began to restrict its release, and they released it out in stages over time. And that kind of a couple of years ago kind of started this shift among major tech companies like Google and Microsoft and Meta, where they were being much more restrictive in terms of how they were releasing this technology. And ChatGPT changed the game because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, it was so effective so quickly, over a million users in the first five days online. It's gotten so much attention. And companies are now following up on it to turn this into a useful product. So Microsoft um, has announced they were, they were going to invest $10 billion in open AI. Following that, Google has uh, declared internally a red alert within their company. And they've said that they're going to uh, recalibrate their level of risk. I think it's fair to read that as uh, be willing to accept more risk to push these AI products out sooner to stay ahead of competitors. Mm -hmm. Because for a company like Google, um, you know, there's there's a lot of money at stake. Uh, Google's search revenue is over $100 billion a year. So if Microsoft incorporates uh, a GPT-like model into Bing, which they're doing, uh, that kind of thing could really threaten Google's business. And so we're seeing this competitive dynamic happen where companies are saying, we got to get there out first. We got to beat our competitors. Don't worry about whether or not it's ready. Don't worry about if it's going to say some offensive thing. Let's get it out there. Uh -huh. Now, with, you know, a language model like ChatGPT, the worst thing that's going to happen is it hurts somebody's feelings. That's the worst thing because it's just text on a screen. And, you know, we're worried about these models having toxicity and bias, which they do. I mean, it could problem. it, it could uh, spread dangerous information. Like they're trying to make it not tell you how to build a bomb, for example. But you could, you know, it could get more casual or chemical weapons or, or biological weapons or, you know, there is dangerous information. That that you don't want it to play a role in spreading, but anyway, go ahead. But so yeah, yeah. so I, I think we're probably not there yet. But but the next generations will definitely be there, where you could ask it something like, "Well, how do I build a, you know, a chemical weapon?" And it could yeah. maybe give you some information that you wouldn't have otherwise, uh, and give you all right, give me step by step instructions for how to how do you manufacture this thing. Um, that certainly we're getting there down the road, and. Um, Companies are trying to find ways to, to sort of safety proof these things. They're not, it's just really difficult to do. But when you think about that dynamic and then transit that into the military space, where, for being honest, the stakes are a lot bigger for countries 
in terms of what happens if they fall behind, mm -hmm. but also if we're fielding systems and they're unsafe, the consequences could also be a lot bigger. And that's, I think, a really troubling dynamic. And so how do we think about ways to put in place some kind of risk mitigation measures so that we avoid one of these races to the bottom on safety among military AI systems? Uh -huh. Okay, uh, a final question before I give you a chance to say anything else you want to say about the book is uh, you've probably seen Top Gun Maverick, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, so there's this recurring line like Tom Cruise, you know, the, the, the enemy has fifth generation fighters in the movie. We only have fourth generation, I guess, yeah. uh, which isn't the case of far as I know. But uh, there's this recurring line, you know, like, don't worry, it's not the plane, it's the pilot. I think yeah. we have some bad news for Tom Cruise, don't we? Yeah. That's right. I mean, I mean, there's a scene in the book where there's a dog fight. Now, is that is that a simulated dog fight in a computer or is it like real planes being run by AI or what? Anyway, there's like a simulated dog fight of some kind where the AI wins. Um, in the in the movie, in the book, Sorry, in, in the your book. book. Yeah, in the book. Right. In the book. So that's right. So the book opens with the um, DARPA's alpha dog fight challenge where they wanted to build an AI dogfighting agent that could be the human. Uh -huh. And this was in a simulator, so not in real airplanes. So there's a lot of caveats that apply. Um, but make a long story short, the AI crushed the human, completely crushed him. And the Air Force sent an experienced pilot uh, to uh, compete against this AI system. And the pilot didn't get a single shot off against the AI. And even more impressive to me, is the AI system was making shots that are basically impossible for humans to make. Mm -hmm. The AI was doing things like taking head-to-head -head gunshots where the aircraft are racing directly at each other head-to-head -head as they're circling around. And there's a split second where there might be an opportunity to get off a kill shot and the AI could do it. And that's really just not, I mean, humans can't do that. That's not realistic that humans could have that precision in place to make that happen. And stay that calm when you're heading, right? I mean, one thing AI does is take the emotions out of it. And often that would be a, a, a good and effective thing from the point of view of war fighting. It's a huge advantage. It's a huge advantage. And we've seen this in other games too, like um, in poker, the AIs that have beat superhuman performance in poker, they make wild swings in betting sizes that are bigger than human poker players do and are actually hard for human po poker players to replicate. Even the best human poker players in the world, you know, they got nerves to steal, but they're still people. And so you put a lot of money on the table, mm -hmm. your heart rate's gonna go up, right? Mm -hmm. The stakes are big. AI is completely unfazed by that. And um, it can do things that are strategically sound um, that are a little more cold-blooded, if you will, and rational, and that are hard for humans to even replicate doing that. Mm -hmm. OK. And in the this AI dogfight thing, was that all done in a flight simulator? That's right. It was in a flight simulator. So they weren't the AI wasn't actually flying the plane. It wasn't like the mock fights in in Top Gun where they're real planes. It's just they're not firing real missiles and bullets. That's right. It, That's it right. Was all so in it a was plane. just a simulator yeah. for now. But DARPA is now working on the next phase of that project where they are starting to take these AI systems and put them in real cockpits of real planes that are flying up in the sky. It's coming. Okay. All right. Well, anything else you want to uh, say about the book? It's called Four Battlegrounds, Power in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, just coming out now. Uh, or by the time this posts, uh, it'll be coming out. I'm not, I don't think it's quite out yet. Uh, but as we speak, I mean, but um, anything else you want to say about it? Um, yeah. I mean, thanks for having me on the show. I'm very excited. I've been working on this uh, for years. I travel the world. Uh, talking to experts in, you know, secret military labs and AI startups and um, in Chinese AI companies to do some of the research for this book. Very excited to share it with readers for Battlegrounds, Power in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. I hope folks enjoy it. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. Good luck with it. And thanks again for uh, for coming on. Thank you.